Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, eyes for Amazon. Billionaire investor Warren Buffett says he's bought up shares of the tech giant after underestimating it, why the Oracle of Omaha changed his tune. And while Huawei fights accusations of espionage, it's still overtaken Apple in the global smartphone market. We will take a look at the big picture. Plus, how the company behind WeWork exploded the industry of on-demand workspace. We'll speak to the company's chief technology officer. But first, to our top story, Berkshire Hathaway has acquired a stake in Amazon. Warren Buffett admits he underestimated the online e-commerce giant in the past, even calling himself an idiot for not buying shares. Buffett has mostly avoided tech stocks over the years, saying he didn't understand the products and markets well enough. One exception, of course, was IBM. Buffett invested $10 billion in the computer giant in 2011, but that didn't pan out so well. He sold nearly all of his shares by 2018. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg's opinion, Shira Ovi Day. So, Shira, any more detail on, on why Amazon would be one of the very few tech stocks Buffett backs? Well, look, I think this investment is mostly about Berkshire Hathaway, Buffett's firm, changing. That over the last few years, Warren Buffett has prepared for a life when he's no longer around. And he's hired these two stock picking deputies, and they have some latitude to invest in what they like. And those things may not necessarily be in Warren Buffett's traditional wheelhouse of these kind of value stocks that don't tend to be in the technology sector, which Buffett has long said he sort of doesn't really understand. It's not in his core competence. And he's avoided it in part because the valuations of those shares are high. Well, I wonder if going forward as well, it's going to be harder and harder to say I'm not investing in tech when every company is certainly aspiring to be a tech company and tech is, you know, changing the structure of many, many different kinds of companies. I think that's a great point. And, and look, you can see that in, in Buffett's investment in Apple, that his firm, Berkshire Hathaway, in 2016 started to buy shares of Apple. And Buffett said then that it wasn't him that made the investment. It was one of, again, these stock picking lieutenants but that they convinced him of the merits of Apple, not as a technology company, but as this kind of very financially predictable and very profitable consumer products company, which is something that Buffett does understand. And so the, the firm, uh, Buffett and, and his lieutenants, bought more and more Apple shares to the point where they're now one of the largest shareholders in Apple, and that has been a very good investment. So Amazon, Apple, these are pretty conventional names. Do you think we'll see Buffett and his investor investing team expanding their their bets on tech? Look, I think all, all bets are off that um, these stock picking uh, colleagues at Berkshire Hathaway, they have wide latitude. You've seen them invest in, in media and tech companies, uh, Oracle, Red Hat, companies like that. And so I, I don't think that investments that have typically been outside of Buffett's wheelhouse, I don't think those are, those are off base anymore. And it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward as Buffett hands over more and more power. Well, Amazon is also threatening another tech giant, and that is Alphabet, which reported results this week. Uh, revenue missed. The stock has fallen significantly uh, since those numbers came out. And I spoke with Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat on the phone and asked about the threat of Amazon in particular, given that more folks are starting their searches on Amazon directly. Amazon's digital ad business is growing. And she said to me, we continue to see people using search robustly across a wide variety of use cases, including shopping. We see significant ongoing opportunities. Nearly half of ad budgets in the U.S. are still spent offline. 90% of commerce in the U.S. is offline, and we're focused on playing a big on digital playing a big role in that and we continue to see people using search across a wide range of areas you know what do you make of uh, poor at an alphabet's explanation here 
The problem that Alphabet had this week is that the revenue growth slowdown, they, they didn't do a good job explaining the revenue growth slowdown. They were very cagey. They said it, you know, there was some different timing of ad products and things like that. I am inclined to believe that it's not the Amazon effect, that it's not that so much money is shifting, so much ad money is shifting into Amazon, that that's showing up in Google's results. But the, the funny thing about, about Google is that it's such a huge company that even if they make some tiny tweak in ads that show up in 10% of mobile devices in the world, that can have a huge effect at Google's scale. And the problem is that Alphabet is not inclined as a company to really be transparent about what exactly they did, again, big or small, to make the revenue growth slow down. And I think that's what freaked investors out was just the lack of explanation. Well, when I asked Porat about the revenue miss, she talked about currency headwinds and she also said look we're comparing to a strong 2018. what do you make of that <laughs> i mean pro uh, that true excuse. but also those are classic company excuses for missing revenue estimates so yes every company um, in the united states is is dealing with a strong dollar yes they had a very strong year last year but it doesn't mean that uh, google has been posting these kind of very consistent 20 plus percent revenue uh, growth numbers and that changed in the first quarter and so it's reasonable to think what is the explanation for this and porad and the other google executives didn't have an answer all right bloomberg opinion shira ovide always good to have you with us shira thanks so much for stopping by coming up Still sizzling, fresh off cooking up a historic IPO, Beyond Meat continues to rise. We'll talk to an early investor. And yes, we can't get enough of the intended puns. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Day two post IPO and Beyond Meat is still heating up. Over the last two days, shares have jumped 167% over the opening price, putting it in historic company. In fact, Beyond Meat ranks among the best performers out of the gate of a public offering since the financial crisis. Our next guest is one of those investors who must be smiling now because his company invested early on in Beyond Mate. He is smiling. John Medved is the CEO of Our Crowd, an Israeli VC firm uh, that's ranked, according to PitchBook, as the most active investor since 2014 with 138 deals. So, welcome. It's great to be here. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, let me ask, when a company rises this much out of the gate, is that good or bad for the company because they could have raised a lot more before even coming out of the gate, right? I mean, people look at it that way sometimes. I look at it, this is a consumer play. We're going after a very big market of the uh, you know, plant protein uh, replacements that are just going to sweep over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that the Beyond Meat IPO was historic is going to be great for the company. And I don't look back at what you know was left on the table, so to speak. As an investor, I am just so happy. And, and what makes us different a little bit is that we are not just a traditional venture fund. At our crowd, we actually allow individuals to get in. And so you had like a dentist from Peoria putting 10 grand in the pre-IPO private round, last one, at Beyond Meat together with people like Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. And that's democratic and that's something to celebrate as well. So you got in when? We got in about six months ago. So, and you still hold shares? Absolutely. So it's good for you. Yes, we're, we're, we're just like ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you hold on to it for? Because you have to hold lift through the, you spiked have, and then it dropped. That's right, you have to hold on through the lockup, right? There's yeah. always a lockup in these yeah. things. And, and you know, you can choose to hold on longer. I just think this is an extraordinary company, well managed at all levels with an incredible strategy. And the product, I can tell you, is something that I diligenced myself and my family personally. Right, you tried it. At, we what not only tried it, we tried it in the middle of barbecuing enormous amounts of meat in Jackson Hole. And we <laughs> went from the, the real meat to this and we loved it. And that's what sealed our interest in the deal. So 
What's next, though? How well, does what's this company next, grow? Right. Well, this company, I think, starts expanding into, uh, as they've talked about, expanding into all kinds of other meat categories. They're talking about steak and bacon. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, as I'm someone who keeps kosher. So for me, this is not just like good tasting and healthy, and believe me, I need it. I'm, I'm someone who sort of works on my weight, but it's also this incredible thing which I can actually eat cheeseburgers now. So, you know, we're, we're rather excited about the investment. We're excited about the company, the big opportunity, and we're looking forward to our next IPO at our crowd, which is uh, a small company called Uber. Well, let, let's talk about that. You were also an investor in Jump Bike, uh, right. which, or, which Uber bought. That's correct. So, so we, again, allowed individual investors to go to our crowd, choose Jump Bike. There we were quite early. We were in Series A, so we were in Jump for several years before Uber bought them. Now you see them all over San Francisco the bright red bikes in other cities and we're so now do you have a stake in Uber? we have a okay. fairly good stake in uber and uh, again we're representing all of these small investors who are now able to not just read the articles about the billionaires who are getting richer whether it's Jeff Bezos or others but they're able to participate in these rounds before they go public and that's what's really missing I think from the marketplace because with all this enthusiasm about IPOs which is well placed certainly with companies like Beyond or, or Uber the problem is the people are making most of the money is a very small circle mostly uh, within a small radius of this studio right now and those are the guys who really make the bucks and then the rest of the people get to join at the IPO what we're doing at our crowd is trying to essentially get them access to these deals as early as possible but before they go public so that the individual accredited investor of which there are 14 million households in the US alone get a chance to participate so you're based in Israel that's correct can anybody be part of this platform anybody who is an accredited investor means you have to have an income of two hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars of assets outside of your uh, primary dwelling but if you're an American you can do that we actually have investors from 182 countries and in each country they set regulations but we work with what are called accredited or qualified investors we're not yet fully retail so how do you get into an, an in-demand private company isn't that funny yeah so it turns out that you have to add value today right the best companies can get money from all over. There's a ton of money in the market. But they choose from investors who can actually help them. And a group like our crowd that represents 30,000 accredited investors all over can help like mad. We get them connections to customers, to hires, to potential media coverage, and they want our crowd involvement and that's why they're coming to us so what other opportunities will we see you you mean you've done a lot of deals <laughs> well we have a, tell us about the well, next we, dozen the last <laughs> uh, couple of weeks we announced three deals together with softbank mm -hmm. actually uh, we participated in a 300 million dollar round for lemonade which is the very cool insure tech company we uh, participated in a round for kluke the big chinese uh, unicorn in the travel space uh, we participated in a round for Climacell, who are doing next generation uh, climate prediction uh, software. We have companies like Zebra Medical who are interpreting radiological images with AI and SiteTech, where I was there together with them last this week at the Milken conference, who are doing incisionless surgery. Mm. On our site, every week we have a new deal. So with SoftBank potentially spinning off the Vision Fund, taking yeah. it public, does that impact you? Mm -hmm. We love that idea, okay? I mean, uh, first of all, you gotta give these guys credit. They're trying to think out of the box. They're thinking big. Masa is brilliant. People like Rajiv and Ron Fisher, the guys who are there are smart. Mm. And what they're trying to do is address very much the problem that we're talking about. They wanna give mom and pop investors exposure to this through potentially the Vision Fund, if these rumors are correct, and no one knows if they are or not, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> but the, re the reality is that I think in general, opening this up to a broader range of investors is what the market needs. And whether it's platforms that are somewhat smaller than SoftBank, like our crowd, or SoftBank doing it, I think it's all good. All right, John Medved, CEO of our crowd, uh, fascinating strategy. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching for Uber as well. We're covering it here every day. Good, thank you. <laughs> well, Thursday, Expedia reported first quarter revenue that missed analyst estimates as its short-term rental business, VRBO, continues to cool off. Sales came in short at $2.6 billion, while revenue growth from VRBO slowed to 14%. 
This is the company struggles to keep up with rivals, including Airbnb, in the rental market. Expedia CEO Mark Okerstrom spoke to Bloomberg earlier about the results. Take a listen. We had broad strength in our core OTA business, and we were very pleased with earnings growth. Adjusted EBITDA was up 42 percent. Uh, adjusted earnings per share improved by 41 percent. You know, there was that spot, though, in the report uh, talking a little bit about how our Verbo division uh, had decelerated a little bit as we really transitioned this business towards a global brand oriented towards the huge opportunity that's that's ahead of us. But expectations were a little bit higher. Uh, we are very confident in the, confident in the direction, though, and feel, feel good about the trajectory and really how we started 2019. Let me push you a little bit on that. Is there a concern that perhaps the strategy is too towards the short-term rental business, given there's so many players in the space already, Marriott is entering it in a big way, we also have other companies entering it, and, you know, the amount of listings that you have is so much smaller than the likes of Airbnb or Booking, for example. What, what would be your strategy? Well, Expedia Group has a larger strategy, which is really as the world's travel platform. Alternative accommodations is one piece of it. It's an important piece of it. But it really is just one piece of a, what is an, a massive industry. Travel is a $1.7 trillion industry. And essentially, we want to be the place across all of our brands where travelers can come, whether they are corporate travelers or leisure travelers, whether they're looking for a traditional hotel, an activity, a flight, or yes, an alternative accommodation stay. And find that and an Expedia Group brand. Uh, the alternative accommodation space, honestly, it's quite in its early stages. It's well over a $100 billion market. Uh, it's just in the early days of going online. We look at and see it as a huge opportunity for us. And quite honestly, we're just getting started in the space, but we think we believe some, bring something super unique to the table. Uh, we're excited about Verbo's progress, but again, it's really part of the overall Expedia Group story. Good morning, Mr. Ogerstrom. It's uh, Guy Johnson in London. Is Airbnb a different company in the public markets? Is it a different competitor once it goes public? Well, I think that's the question. I think we've seen some very well-funded private companies uh, exist for a very long time, and oftentimes they play by different rules. Once you get under the spotlight of investors and analysts and quarterly earnings, sometimes people do behave differently. I think we're very interested to see how going public, if they do indeed go public later this year or in, or in 2020, how that does change their behavior. Um, are you going to have a deal with United come October? Well, that is a great question. I think we would be absolutely bewildered if we didn't have a deal with United. Uh, listen, we've been in business with United and had a, a very solid partnership with them for over 20 years. Uh, the world has changed a lot over those 20 years. Uh, Expedia Group has gotten a lot bigger and actually gotten much more sophisticated in terms of the way that our strategic partners are taking advantage of the value that we can bring. Uh, we hope that United uh, makes that journey with us and can start to explore many of the ways that we can create value together above and beyond what we do uh, today. That's the dialogue we want to have. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're their own unique uh, business. We have a very diverse set of partners. We'll be okay either way, but we really want to get down to the table with them and really talk about these ways that we can create more value together. How can we expand the pie? Expedia CEO Mark Okerstrom there. Coming up, demand in the global smartphone market might be slowing down, but that hasn't stopped competition for the top spot. We'll tell you who is unseating Apple in the ranks next. This is Bloomberg. Huawei has overtaken Apple to claim the number two spot in the global smartphone market. It is moving a step closer to its aim of displacing Samsung as the biggest seller of the devices. Shipments have jumped 50 percent from a year earlier, this despite a barrage of accusations that it aids Chinese espionage, allegations it has repeatedly denied. Joining us to discuss our very own Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman. So, Mark, how did Huawei do this, even in the middle of all these accusations? You know, I think it really comes down to Chinese consumers not buying iPhones in the amounts that it used to. Uh, if you look at the global shipments or in the shipments in China 
being a primary portion of that. Apple was down 30% year over year according to IDC estimates in the all important holiday quarter. We already knew that Apple struggled in China during the holiday quarter, so that's not really the news here. The news is that Huawei is continuing to perform well. It's about 4% away from being the market leader, away from Samsung being 19% versus 23% at a time when there's so much discussion about the Chinese government's involvement with Huawei's devices. Now, Samsung's having some challenges of its own. As you've reported, their big foldable phone debut, um, they've had to postpone the launch of that because of some potential defects. Is Huawei overtaking Samsung at some point realistic? I think it's extremely realistic in the next year or two. I mean, if you just look at the momentum that Huawei has had, unless there's like another big catastrophe or even more discussion about the Chinese government's involvement, uh, I really don't think that there's any slowing down Huawei, at least in the near term. Uh, Samsung has problems, right? It's not just Apple that's not selling well. Samsung was also down uh, year over year. They were down about eight and a half, nine percent. Apple was, you know, about triple that, but Samsung was still down, whereas Huawei and one of their competitors, Vivo, were the only ones that were up uh, year over year. So I think Huawei has a long road ahead of them uh, unless something you know, catastrophic happens between now and the next year or two. Now, uh, do we have any regional trends on Huawei? Obviously, we know that Huawei is banned in the U.S., banned in Australia, New Zealand, um, and you know, potentially on the verge of, of, of some restrictions in the U.K. But how is Huawei doing in other markets, and are these accusations of espionage uh, or, you know, sort of distrust in the company impacting them anywhere else? Yeah, so, you know, Huawei, obviously, China, like you said, is their bread and butter, but, the, you know, they make lower cost phones. And these are really well received in parts of Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, uh, India, and other parts of Asia. And the Huawei brand is extremely strong outside of the U.S. And even though they are banned in the U.S., there are uh, some ways to get these phones. You can buy them on Amazon, you can buy them from some non name brand retailers and just, you know, hook them up to your cellular network. Uh, the part that people are really concerned about with China espionage relating to Huawei is their telecommunications equipment. Those are the devices, the infrastructure that allows you to make phone calls, basically the, the networking towers and the devices that make it all work. It's not exactly the handsets itself, but it's all the same brand, so that's why you're seeing that impact. Right, two big parts of the company. So just 30 seconds left, left Mark. If you could predict in two years, who are the top three and in what order? I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> Well, please don't hold me to it, but uh, <laughs> unless something big happens and there's a new challenger that just skyrockets, I would go with Huawei 1, Samsung 2, uh, and Apple 3. All right. I'm going to quote you on that. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, thank you so much, as always. Coming up, one of the biggest co-working companies we work going public, officially the Wii Company, how they got so big so fast. Next, this is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Well, the world's biggest co-working company, WeWork, owned by the We Company, is joining the slew of tech startups heading to the public market. And it is expected to be one of the biggest IPOs this year. The company is at the helm of the collaborative workspace industry with over 425 locations in 100 cities. Since 2010, WeWork has raised over $12 billion in funding, most of it from Japanese conglomerate SoftBank, and it is looking to go beyond leasing office space using data to track and optimize office space. Joining us to discuss the WE Company's Chief Technology Officer, Shiva Rajaraman. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hi, Emily. Yeah. So, WeWork did grow so big so fast, mm -hmm. and I imagine there is a massive techno technological challenge yes. behind that. How did you do it? Let's step back. There's three capabilities <laughs> when we think about WeWork. Like yeah. one is how do we offer space as a service? And if you just think about it, it's really basic. Are you looking for what location do you need? Where do you need it? How long do you need it? And are there different pricing models for it? So one of the things we've done is effectively taken all of this space, put it into a big database, and we start to shape it based on what we see out there in the market. So some of that's just pricing autom automation at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Some of it is how do we automate that supply chain of delivering a building? Mm -hmm. So we open 15 to 20 buildings a month. 
So anything we can use to automate or augment a person through machine learning, we're taking all that data in one central place and starting to create an engine around that. And that's key to successful scaling today. So technically, what's the hardest part of, of, of doing this? I mean, it, you, mm -hmm. it's such a massive physical endeavor. Sure. I, I would say the biggest technically challenging thing about this whole thing is that operational scale. Mm -hmm. So if you step back, you don't want a lot of variability at the end of the day. You want to step back and say, hey, can I deliver this building on time, at quality, as people need it? And that's where you need operational technology that really works in a way that normally construction has not worked in the past. And then how do you manage that across different global markets? Uh, the key thing is starting to understand what's local and what's basically global. So we take a lot of these things, we look at the global data, and we step back and say, hmm, what are we learning from that at a global level? But then there's certain things like procurement of materials that are hyper-local. Mm -hmm. And so we're always keeping that balance in check. So where should we look to see you expand? Geographically? Geographically, anywhere there's demand for large enterprises. We're 35% enterprise right now. And if you but are there markets that are countries that are particularly hot, particularly in need? So Europe, Asia, mm -hmm. Latin America is a place that you should keep an eye on as well. Mm -hmm. What about strategically in terms of growth? I mean, obviously, yep. you know, you're rebranded, you're the WE company, mm -hmm. you are expanding the business model to include this you know, data sure. part of it. One, one of the key things there on the strategy side is that we need to start to look at, so we see this demand and we start to get critical mass in different areas, can we disrupt the business model a little bit? So let me give you an example. If you take someone like G Health and Soul, they had underutilized real estate. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we went and redesigned that and so they can use it in a more flexible way. But we also created a new membership called the City Pass, which gives all of their employees access to WeWorks throughout Seoul. Now they can go where they're more productive at the end of the day. So one of the key things we're looking at right now is what's a density that translates to interesting memberships that allow people to be more productive. Obviously SoftBank is a huge investor and there's a story in the Wall Street Journal that they're planning to spin off the Vision Fund or take it public. Does that impact you? No, it doesn't. We're focused right now on how do we grow, how do we scale that profitably at the end of the day, and start to step back and say, can we reinvest so we get more and more coverage of the world so we can offer people interesting products? But what does it mean for WeWork's relationship with SoftBank as an investor? No changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of M&A. Where, where should we expect you to do more? Right now, well, let's talk about the M&A that's created a fabric that we can start to offer to enterprises. So when we think about enterprise, we sort of step back and say, what's our Google Analytics for commercial space? Mm -hmm. And so can we help these enterprises create a good workplace experience through things like room booking software, all the way to understand how they use space so they can come and use WeWork on demand if they need it? or we can help them grow in the future if they're looking at new markets to basically expand into. So you bought two companies recently, Team, mm -hmm. Euclid, what does that bring to the... So what Team does program. is effectively says, for your campus, can I help you book rooms more effectively? Mm -hmm. And can I make sure you're using them well? Do people actually check in or not when they actually come into the room? Are only three people in a room versus 10? Could we load balance that a little bit more effectively for you? And then you look at Euclid, part of this is stepping in and saying, what about the broader space that isn't bookable? So can we use Wi-Fi to understand, hey, your common spaces are used or underused. Can we start to create a better mix of how people um, get to a productive workplace at the end of the day? Um, you know, concerns about privacy security at an all-time high, and we've seen you know, many, many threats, and, and we see Facebook pivoting to a more private so-called future. How do you protect the privacy of your the people who are working mm -hmm. in your spaces, given that they're all from different places, sure. some of them are, you know, individuals, freelancers, you know, that, that must be a challenge. It, it, from our perspective, one is that we care about the aggregate mm -hmm. at the end of the day. We don't care about the individual. So we take this data up and we don't want to preserve any of that personal information about someone. We care much more so is on average, are people using rooms in this way? So it allows us to do a layout at an aggregate level. And our business model is aligned such that if you have a membership with WeWork, it's really not about having advertising you know, at the individual level. It's much more about optimizing an aggregate so we can create a better space environment for the whole. So we definitely feel like there are fundamental rights on the privacy side. You should be able to opt out of it as an employee. We should look at this data in aggregate and create a good seating map, but we don't care so much about the individuals in that mix. Now, there are other uh, co-working space companies out there. There are companies that tailor themselves uh, to women, for example. You know, who do you think of as, as the competition, and how do you compete with 
obviously you have scale, mm -hmm. but how do you compete with smaller players who might be offering a more personalized approach? Sure. From our perspective, the global network allows us to do things very creatively also on the local network. Let me give you an example. Right now, members can opt in, effectively tell us what they're interested in or what skills they're also looking to improve. That turns into a dashboard that our community teams can look at and program for those buildings. So if a building goes in one direction or another and you see an interest trending, so for example in Brooklyn, urban gardening is a thing, okay, at the end of the day. And so you've got, we did an incredible event on that front and it got people engaged. Now, as we look at the broader network, if one of those similar interests spikes, the community teams get recommendations on the best events to throw for them. So that's an example of where we can be very hyper-local but be global. And we're doing the same thing with Ask for Help as well. Mm -hmm. So as an example there, let's say you're a woman founder in a WeWork and you want to find someone who's an equivalent peer who you can have lunch with and trade ideas on. You'll be able to ask for help. We'll find that person in the network and actually book a room where you can meet. Mm -hmm. So we're really interested in reflecting the local community but with a global network effect and recommendation engine. All right. Well. We've reported that the WE company mm -hmm. has filed to go public, and I know you can't talk about it, but please tell us anything you can. Just <laughs> excited about scaling, you know, more locations at the end of the day. Really, we're super excited about automating that, collecting the data so that we can just streamline these operations, and then ultimately, great community. So okay. elastic space, instant community, that's what we're focused on. And that Beyond Meat IPO is looking pretty good, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Shiva Rajaraman, uh, WE company CTO, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us. Of course. All right, Sinclair Broadcast Group has agreed to buy 21 Fox Regional Sports Networks from Disney for $9.6 billion. Disney previously agreed to sell the networks as part of its acquisition of 21st Century Fox. After regulators voiced concerns about its control over sports television, the deal marks a big push into sports programming for Sinclair, which is primarily focused on local channels. The company plans to acquire the networks via a new subsidiary called Diamond Sports Group. Coming up, the European Union's battle with big tech continues. We'll discuss the latest on the antitrust crackdown next. This is Bloomberg. In March, the European Union hit Google with a $1.7 billion antitrust fine for abusing its dominant position in the ad market. It marked the EU's third fine against the tech giant and closed its last open probe on the company. But EU Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestager says the antitrust crackdown on big tech isn't done yet. She sat down for an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Take a listen. If you want to say, well, we are fine with the loss of competition, mm. we are fine with higher prices, we are fine with less innovation, then you should also say, well, who's then going to pay? Mm. And that is also the, always a tricky point, because if you lose competition, of course, there is, uh, there's a bill to be paid. And if we do see uh, those standards almost be brought down, as some countries have suggested, what, what would that say, what does that mean for the independence of the European institutions? Well, the European Union is, is a union built on the rule of law. Uh, and I think even though sometimes, of course, our processes, uh, we ask a lot of questions. Uh, so a lot of information is exchanged, but every business know that it's the same for their competitor. It's the same upstream for those who, who give, sell them their input. It's the same downstream for those who buy their products. And I think that, that certainty, mm. that's really a treasure because it knows that you can predict what will authorities do here. You can make your analysis, you can take advice, you know what to do. And I think for the business community, that kind of predictability and certainty, that is part of a good business environment. Another big area for you is obviously uh, American tech. That really mm. made your name here in Brussels. I want to ask you two questions. In terms of the investigations, are we done with that or could we see new probes into those big American tech companies? And then in terms of fines, I do hear the counter argument that ultimately these companies have so much money they mm -hmm. don't really care about it because they can pay it. Should you maybe go into restricting the access to the market? as a way to just make sure that they behave accordingly to those rules? Well, on your first question, uh, no, we're definitely not done yet. Okay. Uh, we have a probe into the Amazon use of data. Mm. 
because they both host a lot of businesses, but they also compete against the businesses themselves. So we want to figure out, is this a fair use of data? Uh, we're still looking into the question of uh, jobs uh, within sort of the Google uh, universe. Uh, we're looking into locals in the Google uh, universe. So we still have uh, investigations that we're working on. That was EU Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestager. I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech's Global Executive Editor Tom Giles to break it down. So, she says she's not done yet. What's she, next? She is never done. Her term is up <laughs> in October, but she's not done. Uh, she's going to use every minute she has in that position, and possibly later, and we can talk about that afterward. But look, she's already gotten 8.2 billion euros in fines from Google in three separate uh -huh. decisions most recently, a couple months ago. Now she's saying we're going to look at the way they do job listings. Mm -hmm. Is there a lack of competition there with places like LinkedIn? Mm -hmm. um, and what about you know what about lo what about local services? Again, the kinds of things where it competes with a company like Yelp. So she's already she's already hit Google hard, and she's not done. So there's at least a couple other areas she's looking at. What and about Facebook? What about Amazon? What about she? Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes to all of those. Uh, on Amazon, uh, they've begun a preliminary look into the way it serves as a platform for this, this marketplace, but also uses data on those, those companies and what they sell on Amazon to figure out its own white label uh, businesses. And so Amazon is definitely in her crosshairs. Apple in is, is in her crosshairs with regard to the Spotify complaint, right? Spotify is complaining about how Apple makes its marketplace unfair for the Spotify music app by these ever-changing rules and by this tax on, you know, using the app. And they've had to raise prices in order to stay competitive on to pay the fees that Apple charges it. So Apple's not safe. Amazon's not safe. Google's not safe. And Facebook certainly is. There's, there, we're just at the beginning stages mm -hmm. of Facebook's, uh, you know, the anti-competitive landscape so, for Facebook. So let's Europe. talk about her legacy. You say her, ter her term is up in October. Right. And then, you know, who might come after her? Will they continue that legacy? Right. Well, so what... Right now, she is lobbying hard for becoming the European Commission head. And so that would, be, and, and she's not coming right out and saying it, but she's talking about how they need a woman for the, they've never had a woman before. And that is her tacit way of saying, give me the job. Um, and she's been very effective. She's very charismatic. People like flock around her to take selfies with her. Um, she's, you know, and again, she's been very effective. She's also very open with the press. I mean, we've had a lot of access to her. She, was all, she always explains where she's coming from. She knows how to use the press <laughs> to her advantage. Um, she's, again, very charismatic, been very effective. Those things work to her advantage. Mm -hmm. And if you, and if this spirit of kind of coming against uh, anti-competitive behavior or allegedly anti-competitive behavior prevails in Europe, that's a great forum for her, and she's really established herself as a leader in this area and done things no one else has been able to do and gone after these big companies in a way no one else, certainly not in the U.S., certainly not to the extent that they're doing in, in Europe. Is that going to continue, though, when she leaves? After she leaves, I mean, if she becomes the head of mm -hmm. the EC, mm -hmm. that gives her a platform yep. for continuing to leave her stamp. But again, a lot of these investigations are underway. The next head of anti uh, on, com on competition, it's mm -hmm. going to depend on who that is. I don't know who that's going to be, mm -hmm. but there, she's already got a lot of things in motion. And so someone's going to have to come in and, and justify why they've suddenly dropped them. And I don't see that, that tone changing at all in Europe. The big question seems to remain, will what she has done in Europe have an impact, a lasting impact on the United States and regulation in the United States. You know, we have lawmakers talking about it. We've seen all of these CEOs be called to testify. Right. But there's no new laws. Correct. Yet. Right. On the books. Uh, you know, laws are being written. You know, ideas are being debated. But will the regulation in Europe actually impact the regulation of these companies on home turf? The tail doesn't wag the dog in that regard, but what we do see right now in the U.S. is increasingly, more than ever before, as these companies have become so big, so powerful, and every passing day almost, there's another revelation about the way our data is being misused or the way we're being fed misinformation or being fed harmful content, right? We've talked a lot about the stuff you see on YouTube and Facebook, et cetera. And so there's much more of a willingness among politicians to talk about ways to rein in 
big tech in the U.S., and I think the 2020 election is going to be a big litmus test. You've got Liz Warren talking about breaking up Apple, mm -hmm. breaking up Amazon, and so there's a lot more kind of crossover between the rhetoric we hear in Europe and the rhetoric we hear in the U.S. Mm -hmm. when it comes to certain candidates like Liz Warren. So, you know, and she's really kind of leading that discussion and being out there on the bleeding edge of it. Is everyone else going to go in that direction? No, but she's at least kind of started the conversation and is pushing other people to take a stance. Absolutely. And she's gotten some support on both sides of the aisle for her bleeding edge uh, proposals, as you put it. Tom Giles, our executive editor, as always, thank you. Still ahead, Peloton CEO John Foley tells us why he considers the exercise company to be a tech company first. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Peloton is making headlines after raising $550 million in final funding before a planned IPO. CEO John Foley sat down with Bloomberg. Take a listen. So it's called Peloton Homecoming 2019. It was born out of a, an event that the uh, our Peloton community self-organized. So we found out five or six years ago there were hundreds of people from around the country that had self-organized on social, generally Facebook or Twitter, come together and they decided a weekend to come to New York, to your point, descend on New York, have a weekend, celebrate fitness, come to Peloton Studios, take a ride with their favorite instructor. And this year it's grown to over 3,000 people. We now host it and we get, you know, collaborate with, with the community. So it's a really fun weekend where they get to enjoy New York, enjoy fitness, and enjoy each other uh, meeting other members of the community. That's such an important point. I think about Business Week magazine has talked about how fitness, when you have a community aspect to it, taking a class, being with people, getting the support, that's a big part of, I feel like, the successful fitness models going forward. It's, it's crazy. Uh, yes, absolutely. We're seeing it in intense ways in Peloton. I just walking over here, I met a uh, two African American women. Uh, we're so excited to be here. One was a policewoman from Louisiana, and one was a firefighter in New York City, and they had both lost a bunch of weight on the Peloton bike, and they acted like sisters, like they'd known each other, best friends, and they said they met a couple years ago via the biking platform, via Peloton, cool. and now they're fantastic friends. They're celebrating each other and their friendship, and it was like, wow, you know, we're bringing people together, and that, that community element is something that I didn't anticipate uh, when we built the platform, but it's so real and so fun, and so it's a big part of this weekend. Well, and the story of you building this company is amazing. We're both pretty familiar with it. It's come very far uh, in just eight or so years. One of the most interesting elements, I think, to all of us is the bike. We've got some in the, in the mm -hmm. background here. The app has been so successful, it feels like, of late. Talk about that part of the business model. Yeah, so we call it, Jason, we call it the democratization of great fitness classes. We're trying to bring great fitness on our instructors and our community community to everyone. So if you have $2,000 to get, you know, in your checkbook, you can buy a Peloton bike. If you have $58 a month, you can now finance the bike. But even below that, if you have your own bike or your own treadmill, um, or you like yoga or outdoor running, you can download the Peloton app to your point and pay under $20 a month without any hardware uh, outlay and be taking these fantastic classes. Interestingly, we think there's 23 million Americans with, with uh, treadmills in their homes today. They can tomorrow transform their own existing hardware into a Peloton boot camp experience and throw it up to their 60-inch television screen in their home gym or their basement or wherever they work out and be consuming our classes and joining the community and joining the Peloton, as it were. So it's, it is a big part of our growth. I was just going to say, that's got to be an important part of the financial model. Full transparency, Jason and I both have a Peloton. It's not an, it's a beautiful device, but it's not inexpensive. That's but right. this is a way of appealing to a much wider audience. That's right. We, uh, we say we're platform agnostic with our content. We're Wherever you want to consume Peloton Fitness, whether you go to the gym and you bring your iPad or your iPhone, you can get on the gym bike or the gym treadmill, or you could go for an outdoor run. If you want to go for a 5K or a, you know, three or four mile run, you can have our instructors in your headphones via your Android device or your iPad or your iPhone. Um, so in any way you want to consume and get, a, get taught and led by an instructor via the Peloton platform, we're there for you. All right, so help us look around the corner. What's the next modality you may go after? Because it started with the bike, 
like we went to the treadmill, you have outdoor running, you've got yoga, okay. you've got strength. Where might you go next? Uh, it's a good question, Jason. We, we it's just between the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> we do consider ourselves an innovation and a technology shop first. So we are, we have some pretty sexy, cool stuff on the horizon in the R&D shop, as we call it. We're, we're tasting the dog food as we're building. It's it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of places that you can go elsewhere beyond what you Ab absolutely we like awesome. we like fitness uh, the capital F the macro category we understand there's a lot of different modalities to your point Jason you've studied them more than anybody um, so I think there's gonna be some cool stuff coming out of Peloton in the coming years